You get bad stuff too. You get told bad stuff that you don't pass on. I do get told negative information. Mm. I do pass it on. But the caveat is because I know that this is interpretational, I'm very, very careful about how I say what I say. So instead of me saying like, I see somebody having a car accident, I might say to them, you might want to check your car. You might want to be careful driving. You want to be careful where you park your car. I'll hit it so many different ways that I'm not going to freak the person out and make them go. Jeez, you freak me out if you said careful, to check the brakes on your car. No, you I think a the, lot of people out. I, yeah, and, and I think there's a, you know, this is where we talk about like Charlemagne's. When people give information that affects someone's choices, I have a problem with that. Because I think that we are supposed to leave people better than we find them. We're supposed to empower people with information and insights, not make decisions for them, not do anything above and beyond. Just that, like here, here are the insights, what the person does with it. You know, Maya Angelou, the poet, just passed, and she's got her famous quote, people will forget what you did and forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. And I always start my events off by using that quote and saying, mediumship, that quote is never, should, should never, ever be applied to what I do. I still wonder a little why you expose yourself to this, because, you know, people will, will have a view, you're a crook. Right. Or you're, you're fair income, or, that's straight in for serious. I got You're it. a crook or you're genuine or, or whatever, and you're putting yourself up there to be exposed to this um, criticism, scrutiny, scrutiny yeah. analysis. Why? Because I care. Good money? Um, it can be. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be, but it's not, it's not the purpose. You know, mm. I, I remember when I first started, I, uh, when I first started, I had a very high MasterCard bill, and I thought, not a problem. You know, I've got 20 readings that week. It's going to cover it. Every one of those readings canceled. Every one. And I was like, well, that's odd. And I kept recognizing that pattern. So I had to be trained early on at 15 and 16. Like, you're allowed to be paid for what you do because it's your craft, but it's not why you do what you do. And be careful about that. And I've, and I've had tremendous, we could sit here for hours where you'd be like, dude, you're psychic. Why would you make that decision? Or how would you not, <laughs> like, how could so you, you let that you happen? you don't get advice on your own life? You do, but objectivity is not always... You don't have objectivity with yourself. You always... how, how clear is it? I mean, does something come into your head as a voice, or do you, do you get a sense of it, or what? It's a thought. It's a feeling. Hey, no, it's that's, an image. That's a, that's a serious feeling rather than your imagination. Oh, because it's coming in from no other. It's not coming in from. It's not yours. You're not. A, you're not originating it. So here's the example that I, I use with people. If you were standing in a shower and it's nice and warm, and somebody opens the shower curtain and takes a hose, a garden hose from outside, and sprays you from across the room with ice cold water. Would you notice the difference? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there's a, a difference in where it's coming from and temperature. That's what it feels like. There's yeah. a difference in how the energy is hitting me than but, but what we, I'm thinking. But we all have flashes out of nowhere. We think, oh, you do. That's a good idea. Or that's the thought of there, there's, uh, 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 with me, it'd be mostly professional. Ah, there's something I want to do. Right. And how do you know that you're not being inspired? Well, by How do what? you know? By your family and friends, by a team of energies that you might work with that are there. Like you're, you're a radio guy. So you have a team of producers that are around you, correct? Yeah. Right. But nobody knows that your team of producers are there. They just hear you. So in, in the world of spirit, there are a team of energies. I call them the team. Um, and your team is doing that in an energetic way. And so they're the, helping inspire you. And so maybe there's something you're supposed to write about. And all of a sudden, you go, boom, I'm going to write about this. So you've got a good team. You're successful. You've got a bad team. And in your head, you're bad. Um, I You're think, not successful. I don't know if it's a bad team. I do. I, I do think that there are negative energies on the other side, and I always caution people that you know you can't just open the door to grandma. You got to be careful. Well, what about a mass murder? Have they got a bad team in their head? I could. Yeah, I do. Mm. I think that there are negative energies. Period. So can science. You can you predetermine them? I don't know that. Mm. That's can a good you, question. Can you assess them? Can you you say, ah, oh, this this bloke's got a bad energy in his head? We better. Oh, can I assess somebody's energy? Yeah. I, I can absolutely assess somebody's energy. I can't assess what's connected to them but i can assess that that oh yeah oh god yeah and as a parent that's one of the things i teach with my kids is recognizing the energies that are around you and how somebody else's energy can affect you and to be careful because if you you know if you are a non-smoker and you walk into a smoky smoky pub you walk out you're going to smell like smoke so energetically i think it's important for people to keep their energy clean what about specifics could you find out where mh370 is can i do what could you find out where mh370 is i don't know what that is that's the Malaysian, oh, the airplane, the the Malaysian aircraft that went missing. No, I'm not. I'm not I, don't, my, I don't work like that. I wish I could. I wish I could. 
So it's not possible if you're contacted by somebody to, or to find the family member of somebody who's on the aircraft and talk and say, we want to reach your Uncle Joe. They act, that could, uh, listen, that could happen. If, somebody, if I did not know and I'm doing a reading with somebody and that person's family passed that way, I might get how that person passed. I might get information about that person, but they might not come through. I had one, one very, very clear experience. I was doing a reading in my office. It was a family from Florida. I'm in New York, so a different state. And there was a, a, a major murder in a business. And I got all this information, and the family was saying no. And I was telling them where, literally, where this one was shot, where this one was found, where this one was found. And they they kept saying that it was inaccurate. And I'm like, look, I said, I can only tell you what I'm seeing. I go, I'm just passing it on to you. So the mother went to the investigators, gave the information that day. The next day, the investigators called me and said, only somebody at the crime scene would know what you knew because this was not released to the family, and this was not released to the media. So how do you know that? And I said, because this is what I do, and this is what they showed me. Their next obvious question was, who did it? I didn't get that. It's like I just got a snapshot of what was. And people think that what I do is omniscient. I'm not. It's like literally if you have your biography and you open to chapter 12 and I read two pages in chapter 12, I only know what's on those two pages. I don't know what came before it. I don't know what's coming up next. I just know what's shown to me. I'm reminded of Houdini, I think it was, who said when, when, he, when he died, he was going to make sure he'd come back because he believed in it. What are your plans? What? Oh, I'm not coming back. No. <laughs> I tell my family, I was like, listen, we have to keep the karma train on track. I don't want to come back. I do believe in reincarnation. Do not screw this up for me. I don't want to come back because you guys made me. So you, you won't be uh, communicating with people once you die? Oh, I think I'll make sure that I absolutely connect with my kids and my grandchildren. I'm, I'm totally going to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm that, that energy. But I don't, I don't plan on like, like reincarnate. I, in my head, in my free will, if I have that choice, I'm not coming back here. Is that a good thing to be sort of uh, interfering in lives from, I don't know if I want to live my life with a, a, a dead parent or something over my shoulder? Well, do you do your show without a producer? No. Would you walk in here with this without, would you walk in here doing your show without having some type of briefing? I don't quite accept the analogy as being quite that important or quite that, quite that uh, valid rather. I know, but for me, I do. So we come from a different place of, of, of looking at life. I can't imagine not living my life without having my dead family members and friends being a part of it. Like, unless you were unloved in your life and you have no love, then I could see you coming from that place. But I had a mother who loved me. I have a grandmother who absolutely adored me. I want them a part of my life. I want them a part of what's happening. So yeah, if I was doing your show, I'd want my producers around me and I'd want them to be connected to me to make sure that they know where I'm going and what I'm doing and that I'm going to hit my breaks and that I'm going to, you know, take your commercials and you're going to hit the things that you need to hit because you have to. It's your job. Yeah, and I haven't hit any breaks for a while. <laughs> so, I be, look, thank you very much for coming in. You'll be at the Hamer Hall on the 9th of November. What are you doing here so early? I, I will take any excuse <laughs> to, to come here. I, I would love to live here, to be honest. I love it here. Do you feel Australians are uh, more gullible or more skeptical? How, skeptical? How, how do they react compared I, I to the think... rest of the world? I think that they're, they're like New Yorkers with a positive attitude. It's like they're direct, like they tell you what they mean, and it's just happier when, it's they, when they say it. So I think I resonate with that. Like I resonate with, I, I mean, I've been places where people will, will be condescending and negative when they say what they say. But like you said in the beginning, it's like, you know, I'm skeptical, but you said you were ignorant. You yeah. were skeptical, but ignorant. And I said, that's good. I'm skeptical, but enlightened. So we could meet in the same place. And I think that with awareness, you, you, with, with awareness, you can take action in your life. New York's the most cynical city in the world, though, isn't it? It, it kind of is, and I always joke around and say, if I could do this in New York, I could do this anywhere. But um, New York, I mean, my dad was a New York City police officer and a career military guy. Uh, he, not easy to get what I do past him. I mean, a, a general conversation with him was, why is it that when the psychics work with police, the body's always found by water? If the planet's 90% water, aren't the odds in the psychics' favor? That was my upbringing. So, He's a good man. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know him. Um, Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. John Edward, as I said, Hamer Hall, Sunday 9th of November, 6 to 8, bookings at the Arts Centre. Time.